Thing. All right, so as you know, this, uh, this call will be uh, recorded and uh, put on the cloud and shared on our website as usual. Uh, before I uh, give the floor to Katie for the formal opening, I have a couple of, I have one important announcement and two side announcements. Uh, the first uh, announcement is that we, uh, this call is actually available in French and in English, thanks to the support of our uh, new interpreter for the incoming months, Jimena. So a big shout out to her especially because I tend to speak a bit fast, so I'll do my best. Uh, but so if uh, I don't know if there are any francophone on the call yet. Ah, of course, sorry, Mark uh, will be able to use the, <laughs> the French channel. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so, we, uh, so just to say that if, uh, if you want to help us pass, uh, pass, pass on the word that these calls will from now on, uh, unless, uh, you know, uh, Unless precise otherwise, they will be available uh, in French and in English, and we hope to reach a uh, broad audience that way. And uh, so, we're really looking forward to hear more from our francophone colleagues uh, on these regular calls and on uh, our events more generally. Um, so, um, we have two other announcements to make that are, uh, I'll be a bit shorter. Uh, so, the first one is that GFAN will be launching uh, soon its pledge tracker. Uh, so we've so far don't have the Mahoney pledge to put in there, uh, but as we expect more and more to come up, uh, it will it should be coming live on the uh, should be coming live on the website uh, probably next week. Uh, and uh, the other thing to look out for from us is that we've heard, we've had confirmation uh, this week that the uh, GFAN networking zone uh, that we are co-hosting with GFAN AP and GFAN Africa has been uh, accepted. Uh, so uh, we will, uh, GFAN will be at AIDS 2022 in our own networking zone and we'll be circulating a request for proposal uh, for uh, sessions to be hosted at the networking zone during the conference. Uh, we hope to send an email next week and we're really looking forward to uh, hear uh, from all of you and to be honest to see all of you in person for the first time in a few years. Uh, so it's all quite exciting. Uh, so today uh, we will be talking about, uh, so two announcements. Uh, we'll have uh, a number of updates from the G7 and G20, but we are shifting these around a bit to uh, accommodate for school trips. Um, we'll hear uh, a debrief from the US president uh, budget request, and uh, we'll hear from RBM on their world day, malaria plans, and hope to hear from all of you uh, on, on that. And uh, with this, Katie, the floor is yours. Well, well, thank you, Quentin, but I don't think any more introductions are needed. Um, you know, as we just continue to march uh, towards uh, the replenishment, we'll just continue to try and structure agendas that provides you all with useful and helpful updates um, and gives you an opportunity to plan, um, you know, how you engage with other colleagues who are leading in different files like World Malaria, you know, Malaria or um, G7, G20. So um, I think we're going to pass it over to Mark from Friends in the U.S. Um, to just bring us up to speed a bit on um, the President's budget request that went out last week and confirmed an intentional uh, pledge. I'm not sure if I've got the, re the right language, so you'll correct me where I'm wrong, Mark, but an intention to, to, to pledge or contribute $6 billion um, over the next uh, three years. So, Mark, I'm going to pass it over to you, and I think there's a few other U.S. colleagues who may want to jump in after you, but we'll, uh, we'll open that up after. Go ahead, Mark. Welcome. Uh, Chris is on the phone uh, in, in transit, um, so I'm very happy to be with you. And um, it, it's it's very good news, but I, I do want to uh, you know explain for for all what um, what the, what this is. So every year, um, the president of the United States sends to Congress uh, a, a a proposed budget, and the Congress will will make many changes and not meet everything in the budget. However, this was the first opportunity to see what the administration is likely to formally pledge uh, at the uh, replenishment conference it's, it's hosting in, in September. So the president's budget request has three very helpful elements to our global advocacy uh, and helpful to our advocacy in the United States in our you know, coalition of wonderful partners uh, in global health. The first is a request for a 28%, 28, 30% increase in the US appropriation annually 
to two billion dollars. So that's you know with the math, um, that is th for the first of the three years of the replenishment and uh, thirty three percent of the um, overall replenishment goal. The president's budget request in its prose and its written out text also says that there is an intent to pledge $6 billion over three years. And I think that's a pretty solid um, uh, you know, promise, but it isn't the formal pledge. And the United States will probably save its formal pledge towards late in uh, the, the months leading to September to try and um, jockey with other donors. Uh, and a, a further important element is that the, the president's budget request says that the United States intends to match with $1 every $2 contributed by other donors. Under US law, the US cannot pay for more than 33% of the resources uh, for the global fund. So other donors know that whatever the United States commits to, they would have to match two to one but the reverse is being promised here, that the United States would offer to match $1 for every $2 contributed by all the, by all the other donors. Um, there is, it, it, to do this um, in a very limited overall foreign assistance budget called the State Department and Foreign Operations budget, global health has not grown much. And for the bilateral U.S. programs, PEPFAR, the President's Malaria Initiative, and USAID's TB program, um, it, with variations, they're more or less flat. PMI is up by $5 million. Um, so the community um, notices that and is uh, supportive of, of this kind of special increase for the Global Fund in the year of the replenishment, but it, 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 there aren't increases for the others. And the overall global health community in the United States is concerned that the overall growth um, is not a great deal, like, except for money set aside for um, global health security, perhaps a fifth. Um, so this helps us go to the Hill and, and say, do what the president wants, not just what the advocacy community wants. And this is our talking point to Global North donors or the major donors to the Global Fund that here's what the United States is going to do. If you want to unlock this money actually flowing, large you know, pledges will be necessary to, to match two to one. Happy to take any questions about what this is and isn't. It is not the Congress appropriating, but in normal circumstances like this, what matters is what the administration will pledge to the Global Fund. Is that helpful? Anything? Yes. Thank you, Mark. I think that is helpful. It's such a it's such an interesting process um, that we have to relearn every three years with the with the U.S. But um, so uh, I did pop into the chat just a, a a link to a sort of an advocacy brief that we had done after this, um, and thanks to colleagues in the U.S. who did contribute to make sure that we got the language right um, around the intention of the administration to pledge, but not actually the pledge itself or a confirmed appropriation of the money. So. Um, so that's just there in the chat. Is are there any questions? Um, are there any questions for Mark, or are there any other American colleagues who wanted to add in any uh, any other discussion points or contact? Please just uh, uh, Colin. Hey, Colin. Go ahead. Hey, hey, hi everybody, and thanks, Mark. That was great. Um, and uh, just two small things that I might add on top of that. Um, one is that. At, you know, we are now in the U.S. pushing the the White House and the administration to use their diplomatic muscle to encourage other donors. And we've heard from um, many of you that some of your governments may not have heard yet from the U.S. about the U.S.'s um, ambition and leadership on this. As you hear things from uh, policymakers, bureaucrats in um, in your countries, we are really excited to feed that back to the US administration as a way to encourage them and support them to do that outreach um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, and in particular, if there are specific moments coming up where you think a, um, you know, a pledge from your market might be likely or where you know, a particular point of influence 
where hearing from the U.S. government would be helpful to definitely let us know, and we can we can reinforce that um, as the U.S. advocacy community um, and and apply some pressure here as well. Um, and the other thing that I would just really underscore that that Mark had said, and this is you know a bit inside and it's an unfortunate context, but the fact that the budget was so underwhelming on other issues, I think is an extraordinary statement of the White House commitment to the global fund replenishment and for other donors to understand just how exceptional <laughs> that, um, that intent to pledge was in the context of, again, not a good thing that the rest of this budget was underwhelming on global health. We're disappointed on that. We're fighting on that on other issues. Um, but that it is, it is a real sign, I think, of the level of commitment from, from the White House on this in particular. So really excited to continue to work with all of you on this. Thanks. Thanks, Colin. I think that's really helpful additional context. Um, and, um, you know, as, as these things progress, I think Mark has popped his email there to hear from others. Colin, if you, if you don't mind, pop your email into the chat as well so people can be in touch directly. But obviously, um, I know where to find those two. So if you, if you lose track of those email addresses, don't ever hesitate to reach out to us and we'll connect you. Um, but we may want to um, structure a particular call perhaps in the next uh, sort of two to four weeks um, around those kinds of issues around leveraging the U.S. pledge. Um, and be and have more of a strategic or tactical call. Um, so we'll reach Great. out to those colleagues and you know see if that's something that will be helpful. Um, so we've got Peter and Maziko. So Peter, maybe you first, and then Maziko, and then we'll go back to you, Mark, for any responses. And then if there aren't any other questions or comments, then I think we'll move on to our next item. But Peter and then yes. Maziko. Yes, I will keep it short um, since. Um, we have a new president and Mr. Trump was not not very high on the agenda for our government, but we, we have this new president and I think we could revive um, the, the US-German friendship. Um, so I just wonder if you have any ideas um, on how to put pressure on our government because we are currently completely underwhelmed by, by, by our budget proposals towards the global fund. So this is a real problem. And I think if there would be a strong message coming from the US that, you know, Germany, listen, you lost the war, so do something. So this is not going to continue. This was a joke now, but, but I, I think any strong wording would really uh, help. And uh, since the chief on meeting is going to take place in Berlin, I just wonder, do you have good contacts with the ambassador here that we could possibly sort of play that game, um, US, Germany, ambassador, a strong pledge, you, you understand, right? Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to, to work on that uh, practically. Um, Chris has asked me to, you okay. know, so to work on those donor to donor communications diplomatically and also between legislators. So I'm here. Uh, thank you very much. This is Maziko from Malawi. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to find out um, our US advocacy community, do they need any support from us from the other continents and countries, uh, more especially the beneficiary countries of the Global Fund uh, on the campaign that I've started? Um, and I would like to thank the US government through the president, Biden, for, for, for accepting to be the champion of the Global Fund. Uh, do, we, do you need any support from us uh, for example, uh, I'm reaching out to our embassies within our different countries where uh, some of us were beneficiary countries of the Global Fund. Over. Mark or Colin, did you want to address that question? Um, I, I can. We, we do need that being said to U.S. embassies. Um, and also, you know, uh, I, I'm very thankful for... GFAN colleagues in Africa and in Asia Pacific and um, you know CF, CS4ME for sort of thank you messages to the administration. It is our job as the community to be intense and pure and push for the most, but it is also helpful at certain junctures to reinforce things. As we try and convince you know, the Biden administration to use its time on diplomacy just a little bit on this, uh, and not only Ukraine, um, that thanks is helpful. Thank you very much. Over. 
Thanks, Nikiko. And we'll pop into the we'll pop some links into the into the chat too for some uh, maybe some easy to use tools if it's something that you want to do. As we did have a week of action that focused on a number, um, our colleagues in uh, GFAN Africa and GFAN Asia Pacific uh, coordinated a week of action just after the prep meeting, so in early March. Um, so there are some sort of ready made tools that you can already access. So I'm seeing a, lot, a few more hands getting raised. So we'll go to those questions really quick and then we will have to move on. So, so um, there may be opportunity for discussion at the end of the call as well. But Christine and then Lucy, go ahead. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Christine Yahama from Kenya. I just want to inform you that uh, during the replenishment week through Rosemary Mburu on, her, on our organization called WASI, we happened to reach out to our minister uh, parliamentarians and they agreed, they've set some commitment as well on the GIFCAN funds. And then I've been, I've been sitting on the C7 working group. And one of the recommendations that we've brought forward as we are, that we are doing a joint statement is uh, for the governments, if they could uh, chip in some money for, for malaria, TB, and HIV. Thank you so much. Yeah? And also in the embassies, we also did some letters and we did uh, uh, distribute them in the various embassies in the country. Thank you so much. Thanks, Christine. Lucy? Yes, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Lucy from uh, Equifop, an NGO based in France and West Africa. I just had a quick practical question. Um, I'm sorry if this has been addressed already. Do we know a little bit more about the date and place of the replenishment conference? Um, and regarding the US pledge, uh, we will definitely use this to put pressure on the, on the French government. Thank you. It's likely to be the third week of September, and it is certain to be in New York to take advantage of leaders coming in for the UN General Assembly. Thank you so much. Excellent. Good, good to know. It would be a, a busy week for folks, I guess, if that is when it does take place, Mark. So thank you all for your questions. Mark, Colin, thank you for, um, thank you for your thoughts and um, sharing um, about the about the budget's request, so we're going to um, we're going to move on now. <clears throat> but Mark and Colin and others from the US are always around, so don't ever hesitate to reach out. Um, but we're going to move on now for the <clears throat> excuse me, I'm so sorry um, for our G20 update. I'm going to pass it to my colleague Rachel. It's quite late for her, so let's let her get her her part through in the call, and then we'll come back to the G7 afterwards. So, um, Rachel, if I could pass it over to you for an update on sort of the activities around the G20. Good evening. Hi, good um, morning, afternoon, evening for those depending on your time zones. Hopefully, we'll get to say just one time zone very soon. I'm looking forward to the end of May, um, beginning of June. Uh, just a very quick update from the C20 Vaccine Access and Global Health Working Group. Um, just give me a second just to um, share slides. Um, hopefully my computer will not die this time. So the Vaccine Access and Global Health Working Group did meet for the very first time um, just um, two weeks ago. Um, and these are some of the principles which I still need the group to endorse, um, but I'm sharing it ahead of time with all of you just to um, give you an idea of what, what the discussions have been, that the principles are based around the four main points. Um, there is a chapeau that we will be inserting into all the statements that are released um, for inputs again and confirmation by the um, health working group members um, that will um, that's focused primarily around white space um, intergenerational nearly inclusive gender transformative approaches etc cetera, etc cetera, um, ensuring the right to health um, there are uh, key priorities identified. Again, these are for confirmation by the health working group members. We've got a, uh, a meeting scheduled next week. So for those that are interested in joining the G20 health working group, I'll pop the message, I'm sorry, a link for you to um, 
uh, sign up for um, for the listserv um, to get more information shortly after the presentation. Um, there are some cross-cutting issues that we've identified, which include digitalization, gender, human rights, um, and four main priority areas. Uh, this will be the global health architecture, which includes issues on financing, issues around um, not only financing nationally, but ensuring that we are continuing to strengthen and finance international health institutions, such as the Global Fund. Um, there will be discussions by the working group and further elaborations on the proposed Global Health Fund, which is, seems like a hangover from the G20 presidency from Italy last year, digitalization and ensuring that there is involvement of communities and civil society in all um, conversations and decision-making processes in the global health architecture. There is um, the need to look at expanding access to all health and not just only COVID-19 commodities, making, the op making use of this opportunity around discussions of making um, expanding access to COVID-19 commodities more generally, because we're also addressing similar issues like IP, um, technology transfer, um, R&D, etc. There is the emphasis and continued focus around universal health coverage, um, ensuring that we reduce out-of-pocket payments, not to forget the SDG targets, um, ensuring that mental health is included in the conversations and the focus on key and vulnerable populations. Then strengthening the public health ecosystem, so not focusing only on health system strengthening, but making sure that we are investing and strengthening communities and civil society um, organizations and systems, addressing the One Health approach, um, pandemic preparedness and response, and also obviously digitalization of um, the, the public health ecosystem. So sharing again then very quickly, this is the health track timelines um, that was, that I copied and pasted from the issue note of the health working group that will give you a general idea around some of the key um, related um, meetings happening at the G20 level. Uh, there are three issues identified in the in the issue note of the health working group of the G20. Uh, so just last week, the first health working group was held um, and they discussed and prioritized um, global health protocol standards, which was basically how do we get people to travel so that our tourism industries um, accelerated and recovered, um, identifying um, the use of a universal verify, which is a QR code of some sort that G20 countries will pilot and use and which will be rolled out to other countries. I think there are some specific um, issues related to that, that um, Encouraging the, the leadership of the G20 to, 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 to renew the political commitment of ensuring um, standardized health protocols and in terms of travel is encouraged, but also then flagging again that um, there are other countries in the world that need to be also included in this conversation. Um, and, and their inputs would be needed also at this point and not just later on after the G20 have, um, countries have piloted this initiative. The first health ministers meeting is actually going to be in June. Um, it's not going to be in May to this um, timeline. I'm, I'm just going to then shift to the other um, timeline that gives a, a, a more updated um, overview. Uh, there will be it will follow the G5 meeting really shortly in terms of the second health working group. And based on our understanding, the the, the theme that will be under discussion in, in the spotlight will be around glo building global health system resilience. Um, this will be where the Global Health Fund, which is proposed, will be probably discussed, the mechanisms in, in, in terms of pulling resources together, etc. There will then be the health ministerial meeting, um, and the third health working group will be um, G20 health working group meeting is held in August um, and they will be focusing um, on expanding global manufacturing and knowledge hubs for pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. Uh, there, 
there will be the C20 policy pack, which we hope as the health working group to be able to finalize um, in June, um, depending on the appetite of the group to be able to ready this by um, the second health working group meeting um, and the health, um, sorry, the C20 policy pack will be finalized in July and the communique shared in August. Uh, to note, the C20 summit is held in October, and so that will be after the replenishment um, moment. Um, but I think that will continue. I think there will still be key messages that will continue depending on whether or not we reach the target. But even if we've reached the 18 billion target, we could still use the opportunity to continue um, emphasizing that 18 billion is not enough. Um, there will be another joint health and ministers meeting in November afterwards, flagging that we have only found out on the G20 website um, that there is a joint ministers um, meet um, task force of the health and finance um, working groups. Um, so we're still trying to find out more information around this from our colleagues. Um, and we've just had a call with the finance and taxation or is it ta taxation Taxation and Sustainable Finance C20 Working Group earlier on today. Um, so we're trying to work more closely together to ensure that key messages um, around financing are um, and health are incorporated in both our statements. So I will um, um, bring, go back to you, um, Katie. Thanks, Rachel. Sorry, Thanks. distracted. I'm just looking at the messages. Yeah, no, you're good. Um, thank you so much for that update. There was a there was a message about whether or not you could share those slides with us so we can pop it up on our on our website um, with, as a resource from this uh, from this call. So let us know if that's possible. Or I model. will be able to share the finalized version after we've had our um, our meeting on the 14th. So um, hang on tight till then. Okay, we will make sure it does get circulated when there's the the version that Rachel says we can share. So. We will make sure that you get that mark and that others do as well. So Peter, uh, I'm going to pass it over to you for updates in terms of um, the um, in terms of the G7 and the work that's been taking place from the C7 Health Working Group, and then we'll go back to everyone for any questions um, that that they might have around the G7 and G20. So Peter, go ahead. Yeah, thanks to Rachel first. You really make me, made me nervous now because we don't have a presentation. So we are going to just talk about what we have did. Uh, so we are basically at the end of the process to develop a one page paper on uh, uh, our recommendations that were uh, produced uh, together with, uh, with, the, with a group of originally 120 uh, participants, uh, but only roughly about 30 to 40 were, were present in the meetings and worked with us on the recommendations. Um, so the, the, the work itself, we had four, four to five meetings by now. Uh, I was the co-facilitator together with uh, Robin. Um, and um, we identified, when we started the process, we, we identified um, five topics that, that where we sort of framed our recommendations around. So the topics were universal health coverage, pandemic preparedness, communicable and non-communicable diseases, equitable access to medicines, and health financing. And of course, uh, under health financing, we managed to, 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 to put in the pledge uh, uh, based on um, on, on, on the, the global fund investment case of 18 billion and ask uh, ask countries to support that uh, of uh, of course um, we start as well um, with um, with a chapeau and when I just read what uh, what Rachel you you did write down I think you just copied and pasted it from our recommendations but this is this is okay so work work is done um, of course we refer to to human rights based approaches we we we, we refer to, um, um, to to key uh, populations and to all the standards that 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 we identify we refer to gender equity equity to 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 one house as our HR and all these key principles 
and this was uh, one of one of one discussions we had in the groups was you know okay everybody refers when he comes up with recommendations refers to the key principles so we told them okay there will be a chapeau we mentioned all the key principles here you don't have to repeat them in your recommendations um in practical um yeah, the recommendations on uh, UHC is, of course, to recognize that in 2023, we will have the high level meeting on UHC in the United States, um, and we uh, developed the recommendations from there uh, on on um, pandemic preparedness, uh, we argued that the WHO needs a, a strong, um, a strong role there and uh, act a um, equitable access to, to all commodities should be secured on communicable diseases. We, um, uh, yeah, we talk about vaccines, therapeutic diagnostics, um, prevention measures, uh, and that this needs to be uh, there. We talk a, a bit on obesity uh, and, of course, on the most vulnerable equitable access. Of course, we talk about the TRIPS waiver. We say that uh, this should be the waiver should should be supported by um, by 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 governments. And as I said, on health financing, we we focus a bit on uh, or we focus on on the global fund and to mention, of course, ACT A, C, B, Gavi, and global finance facility um, and we refer to, to, to the discussions around glo global public investment so the paper the paper is basically ready what we have now is that we still have to shorten it to one third and we have a proposal from our colleague uh, that just did get us uh, today and of course this is uh, it, it reads a little bit difficult of what we had developed together. And uh, for, for the time being, um, I think after this call, I have to discuss with, uh, with Robin on how to continue there. So my proposal would be that we deliver the text that we worked on, and then we deliver a shortened version uh, as well and let Venro, uh, which is a, a organization that is that, that sort of uh, structures the, the, the process and facilitates um, um, the, the, the C20 meeting to, to, to deal with that. Uh, because I think, I, I personally think it's completely absurd to come up with a one page paper that should be a result of a two months process. Uh, so this is abuse of civil society uh, voices, but, 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 but this is my personal opinion. And of course I cannot say this in official meetings with them, but this is exactly what's going on. Um, Anyway, we have to deal with that. So we parked some some uh, topics that we could not address in our discussions, and uh, there will be a discussion tomorrow where we are going to decide on what to do after this one-page paper is delivered. And for me, this is only a paper, uh, so the the important uh, process starts now after delivery of uh, of these recommendations together with the other working groups, of course, uh, and. Um, my aim would would be to sort of structure a process where you can work together towards the C7 meeting in Japan and maybe do this work in collaboration with C20. So even in the structure of our, our working group meetings, this was one of the points always to sort of address uh, C20, G20 uh, together with uh, C C7 and G7 in order to sort of make clear that that there are uh, discussions that to, should take place um, in 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 uh, both uh, for us. Another proposal would be to to sort of have a discussion on on these issues as well during the Chifan meeting. So. Katie, you've not been included, but we came up with a proposal, so <laughs> we didn't want to shock you. Uh, but but anyway, it's been discussed internally, and uh, uh, there are some proposals to use that meeting as well to, to address the issues. Because many, and, and this is really surprising, that that all those people who are really active are chief fund and global fund affiliated. So for us, when we looked for speakers, it was almost difficult to find speakers that don't have a strong global fund portfolio. And of course, we, we had to sort of deal with that as, uh, as well. So there will be um, the civil society, um, no, the, C, the C, C7 meeting 
uh, in uh, May, May 4 to 5, there will be a round table. Rachel is going to speak there. And um, um, and my my colleague uh, as, as well, there, there will be a, a very brief breakfast meeting where I have the honor to talk for one minute about the result of the meeting. So I'm already delighted to do that. And uh, of course, day and night, I, I think about what, what to say in one minute, but um, I'm sure uh, everybody is going to survive that. There, there will be a joint ministerial meeting of the G7, uh, G7 states uh, from May to May 18 to 19, where the ministers of the development aid and uh, health are going to to meet, so this this might be another entry point for advocacy work. And now, Robin, please, uh, I I did it in my way. Uh, please, you, I'm I'm sure you're parking now and can jump in. Thanks. Yeah, and I just need to jump in as Katie. We do we do have a uh, we do want to get to some updates around World Malaria Day as well. So, Robin, if you have anything to add, please do so. But um, I won't be quite as strict as one minute. But if you could try to be brief, and then we can open it up for questions. Sure. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Peter. Um, Peter, great overview. Really, really helpful. This, what you see on your document here, as Peter said, is the, the latest version. Um, we were restricted to 3,000 characters, which is less than 500 words. Um, and I think, you know, this is indicative of at this short paper together with Peter's one minute, together with a three minute intervention I made at a round table and a five minute intervention that Rachel and I are going to be having during a high level round table really speaks to the fact that civil society voice is really restricted. Um, so the only thing that I would add here is just to flag and underscore what Peter said around really trying to build the linkages between what's happening at the G7, C7 with what's happening at the G20, C20. Um, and so the other piece is, um, that of course our advocacy around the issues raised in the various iterations of this paper um, don't necessarily end at the end of May after the ministerial meetings and certainly don't end um, our advocacy work after the leader summit at the end of June. And so we will be looking and we've already started to discuss within the working group, um, how else might we wanna be getting out the word? Would we like to be building out specific briefing papers on each of these five key recommendations? And we'll be looking at ways in which we can um, work together with our uh, C20 colleagues to ensure that the materials produced here are also useful for the discussions and dialogues that are happening within the C20 um, prep work. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robin and Peter, and also Rachel, thank you. Um, Rachel did pop in a link about how to get connected to the C20, and I popped in the link around the Civil 7. Um, so please do look in the chat. Are there any questions or comments um, for our colleagues engaged in these high level um, processes? Just raise your hand or if you are having trouble finding that function, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and jump in. I think we've been super clear, that's good. Good, yes, and we, we haven't limited you to one minute, even if I did give a slight uh, indication to be brief. So, um, well, we'll welcome you back at, uh, at any moment in time, Peter, Rachel, uh, Robin, when it's useful. Um, to update GSANERS um, in over the coming months as these meetings are taking place and um, with requests to amplify action or um, take action within our own countries. Um, so thank you very much for these updates, much appreciated. And we'll look forward to seeing that presentation when it's available, Rachel, and also Peter and Robin for circulating um, the 3000 character, 500 word statement or <laughs> when it is available and when it has been published. So thank you. Um, we did want to take a an opportunity with World Malaria Day coming up shortly um, to hear from colleagues from, to hear from a colleague from uh, Rollback Malaria. So Millie, thank you for joining us. And I just wanted to pass it over to you um, to share an update on um, what the plans and emerging opportunities are for advocacy for World Malaria Day, especially as it relates to global fund replenishment. So Millie, over to you. Um, thank you, Katie. And um, hi, everyone. I don't think I've met um, most of the people on this call before, um, but I'm Millie and I work with the RBM Secretariat and other partners um, on comms activities in particular. Um, 
we have quite a lot going on for One Malaria Day, so I won't go through everything in detail, but um, I'm, I'm kind of aiming to provide at least a top level overview and we'll, we'll follow up with um, some more documents and information after the call as well. Um, for those who don't know, um, the One Malaria Day is on the 25th of April, um, so coming up very quickly. Um, and our theme for this year is Advanced Equity, Build Resilience and Malaria, um, which hopefully um, aligns quite closely to our kind of key advocacy goal um, this year, which is, of course, the Global Fund Replenishment and reaching that $18 billion target. Um, it also kind of accounts for the fact that the WHO this year um, are also focusing in on innovation. Um, and so that will also cover the kind of theme of innovation for them as well. Um, um, our key call to action will be fight for what counts as it is um, for the Global Fund. Um, and we also have um, a bit of a summary of how this all works together. We've got some key pillars underneath our theme, um, kind of looking to focus on things like kind of building stronger health systems, mobilizing new funding, um, increasing country ownership. Um, and we'll be focusing in on that um, on World Malaria Day through our various activities. Um, in terms of messaging, um, we built a a messaging document this year that's all about supporting the investment case um, for the global farm replenishment, particularly on um, the issue of malaria. Um, and um, we will be continuing to use that um, for World Malaria Day and also in any other activity up to September. Um, and separately to that, we're also pulling together a um, list of proof points, um, which essentially um, will help us to um, support our key pillars for World Malaria Day and really just make sure we're showing the impact of the global fund um, and highlighting all the key um, kind of progress that's going on at the moment in the malaria world. Um, in terms of activities, um, various assets are being developed and a partner toolkit um, has also been created, which I will share after this call, um, but is essentially a hub for all of the various assets and messages that we will be delivering for World Malaria Day, um, as well as things like example social media posts. Um, and so yeah, we'll share that with you. Um, from a media perspective, um, we're looking to coordinate um, a vast range of different partner activities, um, namely thought leadership. We're looking to try and place a thought leadership piece in at least 10 different countries, which are our priority countries um, in the kind of lead up to the global fund replenishment this year. So we'll, I think we have a um, thought leadership piece from PMI in the USA, um, the Malaria No More team will be looking to place content in the UK. Um, also, I know APLIMA have plans to deliver activity in Japan, for example. And then, of course, we have um, various activities in, in the African continent as well. Um, another key announcement happening on One Malaria Day, um, we believe there'll be a few um, vaccine announcements, including um, a piece from the WHO in terms of um, progress and an update on the RTSS vaccine. Um, and also separately to that, there's a piece coming out in The Guardian, um, which is a partnership with the Media Planet um, that various partners will be contributing to um, advocating for the Global Fund for Replenishment. Um, and then from an advocacy perspective, there are various activities going on around the world, but there are three main advocacy events. Um, Ross might be able to jump in um, to provide a bit more detail, um, but the three key events, um, there'll be one high level event with President Kenyatta in Kenya, um, and that's being kind of managed by the um, ALMA team. We also will have a sister event um, in Washington DC. I believe that's being held at the Kenyan embassy. Um, and then a third event has just been um, confirmed, um, which will be led by WHO um, and the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie, um, which will be a French speaking event focused on, on innovation. I don't know, Ross, if you want to jump in and provide a bit more detail on the events. Hi, everyone. Uh, Ross Bailey here from Malaria No More UK. I'm actually going to um, uh, take the liberty of directing over to Tara uh, Bracken at UN Foundation, who is working on this, just to say that vis-a-vis -vis the Global Fund, RBM partnership has um, formed a cross-partnership working group that's looking uh, how we can coordinate as much as possible. And I was delighted to hear Mark's uh, response earlier on some of the work that we can create through 
cross diplomatic um, conversations and delighted to be talking with Mark tomorrow on this exact subject, uh, particularly from the malaria perspective and all things um, reach back to the Global Fund in this year. So we'll be looking to potentially land um, pieces of private advocacy in the background on that one. Going to hand to Tara um, in a second, just on the UNF engagement around the um, event in DC, but just to say we're also really hopeful to be able to land this event in Kenya and I know that waiting to hear back from the Office of President Kenyatta at the moment on this one we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see on that one obviously these things take time but what we'd love to be able to have is something both in uh, yeah the reach donor leads and also reached uh, endemic states um, for malaria at the same time on the same day ideally um, so that we can really make sure that this message is resonating around the world I'll hand over to Tara who might want to say a couple of minutes on the um, uh, DC based event thanks everyone Thanks, Ross, and thanks, Millie. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah Bracken. I'm at the United Nations Foundation, and I'm also um, the RBM Partnership Advocacy and Resource Mobilization Co-Chair, along uh, with Gareth, also at Malaria No More UK. Um, so we have a, a couple really exciting events in DC, as M Millie mentioned. Um, first, on the Monday of World Malaria Day, um, yeah, the United Nations Foundation, through our United to Beat Malaria campaign, formerly Nothing But Nets, um, and Malaria No More US are hosting a reception on the Hill uh, for US members of Congress that will also um, bring in several leaders uh, from the, the Global Fund and Her Excellency Ellen Johnson Sirleaf to advocate for the Global Fund and to, of course, celebrate um, all the excellent US leadership over the last 20 years and the fight against malaria and to thank them for their investments. And of course, to advocate for sustained and increased investment moving forward. Um, we're following on that event uh, with another on Thursday, April 28th. And as Millie mentioned, this is co-hosted with the Embassy of Kenya to the US, um, as well as the um, AU representational mission to the US um, and our colleagues at the African Leaders Malaria Alliance. So we'll be hosting this at this beautiful venue, um, the Potomac Terrace. It looks right out on all the monuments. It's very DC, it's very exciting and it's outside, which makes us much more comfortable um, from a COVID perspective. Um, and the goal of this event is going to be to bring um, African leaders and civil society voices to donor leaders and, and um, enable them to engage in conversation. And we're particularly interested in engaging the African diaspora um, in advocating for the Global Fund specifically, but also malaria programs more broadly. Um, so we're, we have um, confirmed remarks from um, the Kenyan ambassador to the US and to the UN, um, two different <laughs> ambassadors, uh, remarks from the AU ambassador to the US. We have virtual remarks from President Kenyatta of Kenya. Um, we will have virtual remarks from Chantal Bia, the First Lady of Cameroon, um, and we uh, will have a panel involving civil society, the Global Fund, um, TBD, the new interim <laughs> RBM CEO, um, Tara, we've just lost your audio. I think you've maybe accidentally muted yourself. Thank you, sorry. Um, I think what, what you lost was you champion, Francophone champion, Anglophone champion. Um, and then of course there will be space for um, key donor representatives to, uh, to respond. So that includes uh, key stakeholders in the US government. Um, and we've invited the French um, and the UK ambassadors to the US to speak. And we have also invited um, the German and the Japanese ambassadors to attend TBD on whether or not they'll provide remarks. Um, so we're hoping that this will be a really impactful event. Um, where we can engage in some really impactful dialogue, not just remarks, um, lots of space for networking between some of these key stakeholders and the African diaspora community in DC. Um, and, and we'll see if we can move the needle and, and um, leverage this great commitment that the US has made through the president's budget to also increase some of our pledges from, uh, from other critical donors. Um, I see two just unmuted herself. So two from Larry No More US, if you wanna provide something else, please let me know. <laughs> I just wanted to make a quick correction. Um, it was confusing. The congressional reception is actually on April 26th, not the 25th, um, but still happening in DC. Everything else you covered was completely right. We're, we're looking to welcome um, Her Excellency Pre President Johnson Sirleaf to be able to be there alongside uh, members of Congress and other administration officials, again, to just really drive home the message how important you know, investing in malaria and both the global fund and bilaterals and that combined fight and, and the value of that fight um, but just wanted to make sure everyone knew it was the 26th, not the 25th. Thanks, Tara. All right. My fault too. <laughs> yes, the 26th. <laughs> um, but that's all from us. Thanks everyone for the, for the time to brief you guys.
thanks. I think it's really helpful um, to hear from all of you um, and to understand sort of what's going on and beyond wishing you all very much luck with the protocol involved with that many ambassadors and uh, and other distinguished guests at, at these events. Um, we look forward to, to uh, receiving the toolkit um, that and the tool uh, the tools that you mentioned, Millie. Um, and also, it would be helpful if we if colleagues if you could coordinate and just let us know those dates maybe in an email or something that we can add um, to this call so that maybe um, people can plan in particular to ramp up their amplifications or social media tweets and stuff like that around those events um, with you so to make sure that they have the most impact as possible so just to make sure we do get all the dates right it would be helpful if if somebody had a chance to write a quick quick email to the gsan listserv um, with that information or share it with Conte and i and we can do that so um, so thank you so i would just open it up for any questions um, for or additional information that other colleagues, we have a number of um, colleagues who are focusing on uh, malaria during their day-to-day -day work um, that are on the call. So welcome any other further thoughts or information or other questions or, dis um, or discussion points with our colleagues. Feel free to raise your hand or just unmute if you have anything that you'd like to ask or share. Also very complete information by the looks of things. So we will await um, more information um, over the listserv. There is a question about the delegation of the European Union to the US, whether they've been invited to the event. So I'm not sure, Tara, if you're able to address that question in the chat. Um, that would be helpful. And I will, because we are close to closing this call and not seeing any other questions, I'll pass it back to my colleague, uh, Contain, to wrap us up. Thank you, Tara. So no no hands up uh so with uh, five minutes to spare which is quite amazing uh just a, a quick reminder of uh, because we had a few people jumping in uh, uh, a bit later in the call um so this call was available in french and in english and uh gfan calls from now on unless uh, uh unless exceptional circumstances or whatever will be available with uh, uh will be available in both french and english uh, so we're really excited to see more involvement from our francophone colleagues. Um, and we also want to make sure that everyone is aware of uh, two upcoming uh, products, activities, events coming out of uh, GFAM. First one being our pledge tracker that is going to come online next week. And the second one being a call for, uh, a call for, 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 a call for a proposal uh, for networking zone at 8.22, which will be also coming out uh, in this week of next. Uh, we're really looking forward to uh, seeing, seeing as many of you as possible there in person. Uh, and with this, uh, unless no one has anything to add, I will close the call and wish you all a very good morning, afternoon, evening, late night for some of us. Uh, all right. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.